Okay, welcome everyone. This session is the first session on the third day. It's Meet WinRT, the Windows Runtime API. And I just have to click into the window. Yeah. Um, I've been doing Foxbo for a long time, so most of you probably know who I am, so we skip that and go to the agenda. So in this session, this session will look a little bit different than the description says. So um, turned out that some of the samples are a little bit harder than I imagined. Um, we still cover a lot of samples. So, and we cover what the Windows Runtime is, how you use it, and what features are available for you to use. So now I'm turning off the camera so that you can see more. About. So Windows Runtime is something that was off my radar for like 10 years. It's, it's already 10 years old. Um, I thought it was really only available for Windows Store apps, Metro apps, Windows modern apps, whatever Microsoft called them at that time. Um, but it turned out that uh, these, um, this API is also usable from, from Foxbot. When we talk about integrate, integrate, integrating other features into Foxbo or in any language, we usually have a few built-in um, interfaces available inside our language. And Foxbo only has two interfaces, actually. One is DDE, Dynamic Data Exchange, that we are not using anymore. And the other one is DLL, 32-bit dynamically linked libraries. The latter is the one that all the other interfaces are based on. Foxpo link libraries, FLLs are actually DLLs. ComServer and ActiveX controls are also DLLs that are loaded into the um, memory space of the Foxpo. These are then used to provide even more complex integration. So we can use the .NET framework using ComServers, or we can use the .NET framework using DLLs using .NET Bridge. We also can use WinForm controls using ActiveX, which are implemented as DLLs, or WPF, SAML, which I showed last year, I think, using WinForms that are using ActiveX. It's getting a little more complex if we're talking about HTML or JavaScript, because we are using ceph via my FP ceph that's using WinForm that is using ActiveX. Um, or we are, can use non-UI elements like REST, which is accessed using a DLL, or SOAP, which we can access using DLLs or ActiveX controls. So basically, everything we do uh, or use depends on what interfaces um, are available to the host system. When we talk about VFP integration, integrating other APIs, other libraries into VFP, we have a couple of issues. The first one is that when we talk about a Foxpo desktop application, everything we integrate must be a 32-bit x86 um, compatible uh, library. We cannot use anything that's based on ARM processors or 64-bit. Um, so any of these are out of question. We also require that the component we are using supports the host system. So it must be able to be hosted into a 32-bit application, which is increasingly hard to do. Uh, in .NET 5, um, Microsoft made a couple of changes. They introduced more COM support, and they introduced WinForms again and WPF. So they moved that over from the .NET framework. But whenever Microsoft is talking about WinForm, it's WinForm as the host application. The, the application is WinForm, and it hosts other controls. What we use on Foxpo is we use WinForm applications as ActiveX controls. And that is something that is not necessarily on the, on the radar of Microsoft anymore. It's not a priority. A priority is to be able to move WinForm developers to .NET 5 to 7 not to enable VB6 developers or Visual Foxpo developers to use .NET WinForm controls. The same applies for SAML Island support, which is used for WinUI 3. There's support for that, but only in WinForms running .NET 5. So again, something that we cannot use. While we can use um, .NET 5 to 7 um, quick 
as well, um, updated his uh, dot, dot, .NET uh, support um, a couple of weeks ago to, to include uh, .NET Core. This all is all limited to non-visual controls. It's all non-visual. The same is true for Windows Runtime. The Windows Runtime will not be, is not supporting any visual controls in, in Foxbots, all non-visual. Uh, in general, Microsoft is moving to a cross-platform approach. They drop things out of .NET 5 and 6 because it's too Windows-centric. And in general, Microsoft makes money by selling Azure time, not by selling FoxPro or supporting FoxPro applications. The Windows runtime does not support the UI. So we are, what we can't do in FoxPro is we cannot create a Windows UI interface and put it into a, window, in a, in a, into a FoxPro form. That's not available for FoxPro. The Windows runtime is also COM-based. It's not managed, it's COM-based. And originally targeted the C++ developer. When I first heard about the, 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 um, the Windows runtime, I was surprised because I lived on a bubble where everything was um, managed or database de dependent. Um, I'm a, a business developer that is using databases, just like most of you. But turns out there's a lot of developers who are not writing business applications. They are writing applications that are written in C++, and there are quite a few of them. The .NET framework never really was for them. They, they needed something else. So what Microsoft created wasn't a, was not a replacement for the .NET runtime. It was a replacement or meant to be a replacement for the Win32 API that C++ developers uses use. So when we look at the requirements that we have as Foxbot developers to use the Windows runtime, first thing is your code needs to be written at least partly in .NET or C++. You don't have to use .NET, you can use C++. I'm for myself, I'm happy not to use C++, not to deal with memory allocations and all of these. So I'm using um, .NET, uh, specifically C Sharp, in this session. You also have to use the um, Windows, the .NET framework, not .NET Core, because one of the things that Microsoft removed in .NET 5 was the WinRT support because WinRT is, as the name implies, only available on Windows Runtime, uh, Windows. And .NET Core, .NET 5, 6, 7, is supposed to be platform agnostic. The Windows Runtime is built into Windows. There's no installer that you can just ship with your application. So the, whatever the user has installed on their system is what you are going to be able to use. The feature set depends on the version of Windows your customers are using. Everything is only available on Windows 10 or 11. So there's no support for Windows 8 or Windows 7. So if you need to support those customers, you cannot use the Windows runtime. Even if you are running on Windows 10, there's certain features that have been added to later versions. So um, the only way to get your customers to use these features is for them to update Windows. Microsoft is pretty aggressive in updating Windows, at least for end users. So most likely your users will all already have the latest version or one of the latest version of Windows 10 or 11. There are a couple of things that you do not need um, that I associated with um, Windows runtime apps or Windows Store apps. You don't have to have a Microsoft developer account. Everything we do is just plain code. And you also do not have to distribute your application using the Microsoft Store. It's just regular, um, regular distribution. Um, it's just an extra FLL or DLL actually that you need to uh, ship with your application, but nothing, you don't have to change anything significantly. So far, any questions from the remaining audience that can still listen? Um, no, I haven't heard any, seen okay. any. I guess I wouldn't have heard them. I haven't seen any. 
So there's an extensive documentation. You don't have to write the link down. It's You will get the slides and all the samples that I'm showing you. So there's an API document, documentation on learn.microsoft.com, the former docs.microsoft.com, which lists all the APIs that are available. And there's a GitHub repository that has a ton of samples um, in C Sharp and in C++ that you can use um, to uh, adjust to your own needs. A lot of my samples are actually based on the Microsoft samples. The tools you need, because you need to do something in C Sharp or C++, um, there are a variety of tools available. Um, you can use Visual Studio 2022 in any available edition. The most inexpensive one would be the Community Edition. The Community Edition is free if you only have, or if you have no more than five developers in your company using the Community Edition. If the total number of um, computers is 250 or less, and if your annual revenue is less than 1 million US dollar. The license is in US dollars anywhere in the world. So if you are close to that limit, you might depend on the license, you might depend on the current currency exchange rate. Additionally, you can use third party IDEs such as Flatbrains Rider, which is what I'm mostly using. Or you can use Visual Studio Code using C Sharp plugins. You can use MS Build, or if you want to go all in, you can use CSC, EXE, and command line parameters. Um, so there's some way for everyone to write anything, something in, in C Sharp. Um, just pick the one that you are most comfortable with. What I'm using in this session is Visual Studio because that's most likely the one that you are using. And it's also the, the easiest one to use uh, due to the support that you have in the IDE. When you create a new project, what you want is a, a class library. You want to have a .NET Framework class library. The way you do it is you choose the language that you're using, C Sharp or VB.NET or F Sharp or X Sharp. Then you select Windows as the, as the platform and library as the output type. And then you additionally, because there are many different libraries available, you also put in framework and there's a search tab. Then your search narrows down to four elements and what you want is the class library .NET framework. You don't want anything of the WPF stuff and you don't want a Windows form control. You certainly do not want to have a .NET class library without framework in the name because that's .NET 6 or 7 or 5 or whatever is installed on your computer. You also have to make sure that in tools options in Visual Studio, you search for package and then go to NuGet package manager. You, for the WinRT things to work, you have to use package references as the default package management format, not the old packages config file. Um, if you have the config file, you will get errors when compiling, even though the references appear to be there, but it does not work. It's actually saying the same thing on the page on, and when you install um, uh, the, the package. Um, you do this by opening the uh, tools NuGet management for, for the project, search for microsoft.windows.stk.contracts. And the first one that has a couple of million downloads, that's the one you want to add to a project. You can install the latest version if you want. It's the, the Final digits 202621 are uh, uh, the Windows build number. It the, the version that you download does not have to be the one that you run or that your client runs um, on, on Windows. It just defines what feature set is available. If you pick an older one, um, it will still run on a newer Windows, it will still run on an older Windows, but you won't see any of these features that are newer. So um, but I usually pick the latest one. You can pick an older one if you want to be sure that it runs with at least that version of Windows. In the middle of the right side, you see that it requires the default package management to be uh, set to uh, package references, what I said before. Um, so that is 
an easy uh, mistake to make um, if it's set wrong. So that's basically how you create um, the, the project. And then we, in the samples, we see what, what the code is that you add. But before that, uh, I want to go into one, well, I'll ask, ask one question in case it's getting, it's being asked. If the Windows runtime is COM, why can't we use it directly in, in Visual Foxbo? After all, we have COM support for decades now. We can use just create object. We, we can add controls to, to forms. So why can, can't we use it? And if it's, if it's available in .NET, why can't I just load classes into um, .NET Bridge. Why do I have to write C sharp code uh, in order to call it? And for that, we do a quick refresher about com. Probably you know most of those things already. Com is a binary standard that is based on C++. So a com object looks like a C++ object. All the features, that's all the methods that you access are accessed through a V table, which is just a list of method addresses and memory that contain um, the, the, the contains the actual code. So we have method one, two, three, and then there's the address for the code of method one, two, three. The interface it def um, that the class is using is defined using internet de uh, in interface definition language, IDL, and it's separate from the binary. It's not part of the binary. The base interface of COM is I unknown. Everything that implements I unknown is COM. Everything that doesn't implement I unknown is not COM. I unknown is supported in Visual Foxpro for all three operations that it supports, query interface. We have the query interface function. We have Sys3097 for AdRef and Sys3098 for release. You probably don't use them in Foxpro because it's really uh, for low level operations in uh, COM. On top of I unknown, there's I dispatch. I dispatch adds other or four more operations, get type info count, get type info, get IDs of name and invoke. You mostly deal with get IDs of name, which translates a name of a method or property into a, the index in the V table and about the, uh, and the invoke method, which is used to call the method. Properties are implemented as methods as well. Internally, COM is using a, a number of functions. It's implemented in only 32 DLL. And every program that is using COM has to do certain things. So there's a co-initialize API function call that Foxbook calls automatically and that every application has to call that's using COM. It tells com what kind of apartment uh, the current thread is participating in. Then there's co-create instance. Co-create instance is what we call create object in, in Foxbow. It's taking a class ID or name, then looking up the information in the registry, locating the com server, whether it's an out of process server or an in process server. And if it's a DLL, an in process server, that DLL implements the DLL get class object function. The function is one of the exported functions in the DLL. So every COM server that you write in Foxpro actually has a DLL get class object method or function that you could, if you want to, call uh, yourself directly to get a COM object out of your Foxpro server. So that's how regular COM is working. The Windows runtime. Um, actually, one more. Um, the support in Foxpro for that is mixed. We have limited support for I unknown. We, Foxpro does support I unknown, but most of the work done for supporting I unknown, so interfaces that do not have a I dispatch interface, was done for Microsoft Transaction Server, Complus, and all of these technologies that Microsoft tried to convince us to use, and some of us have been using some successfully, some maybe not so successfully. Um, we have support for iDispatch. There's a sys function 3095 that 
takes an I dispatch pointer, pointer uh, returns an I dispatch pointer, the integer value of the I dispatch interface when you pass an object. And the other function, the other way around, this is 3096, that you can pass an address to an I dispatch interface and get a Foxbow or COM reference back. There's also create object X that um, supports interface GUIs in addition to the, the COM object GUID so that you can um, create objects and directly get a certain interface that might, that, that has to um, depend on I dispatch actually. You cannot return objects in create object X that do not uh, support I dispatch. The I unknown doesn't have any type information. So in order for Foxport to be able to call a, a FIP method of on I unknown, on any I unknown object on Microsoft Transaction Server, it needs to have access to a type library. Type libraries in regular.com are stored in uh, TLB files. For the uh, in uh, Foxpo actually uses the I dispatch interface. So we always start with an I dispatch interface. Foxpo gets type information for the I unknown based um, interfaces and then uses that to call the objects. Windows Runtime is doing things completely differently, even though it's calm. So instead of co initialize, it's calling row initialize in row API. What is co create um, instance becomes row activate instance. And the method that, or the function that DLLs have to expose is get activation factory instead of the DLL get class object function. It also uses different interfaces. It uses I unknown, and because it uses I unknown, it's com, but that's about the only thing that's equal, identi identical to what we know as com. Because instead of I dispatch, it's use, it uses the I inspectable interface, which gets um, metadata from inside the DLL. It also uses a different type library. It doesn't use type libraries that Foxbo uses. It. it uses Windows metadata files, WinMD files. So these WinMD files are, look like .NET assemblies, but if you open them in an assembly browser, it's just empty methods. There's no code in there. That's because uh, .NET actually, or Windows Runtime relies on so-called language projections. A language projection is something that sits in between the language and the Windows Runtime to make the Windows Runtime look like the language. So there's the C sharp projection built into, or .NET projection built into the .NET Runtime and into the .NET framework that if you use an object or type that is defined in a WinMD file, it actually goes through the row initialize row activate instance um, level steps and it creates um, runtime callable wrappers um, for these objects that are defined in, in WinMD. And because of that, we cannot use a .NET bridge because .NET bridge is not does not know how to access these um, Windows Runtime objects. It only knows how to access managed objects, uh, but not Windows Runtime objects. And .NET 5, these language projections for C Sharp have been removed. So if you use .NET Core or .NET 5.6.7, you actually have to get the language projections back as a NuGet package that you have to add to your project. Any questions on the technical details? We had one question. It was a while back. Okay. Christoph, are you saying you can utilize VFP in WinRT as long as you write some .NET in the same app? No, it's the other way around. You can use WinRT in Visual Fox Pro. At least okay. that's what the session about. I have not tested um, or yeah, not written that an UI app that is using virtualfox.com objects. Okay. Okay. So with that, we go to the samples. There are a ton of samples. Um, some are useful, some are not. Some have alternatives, other ways to achieve the same thing that you can do in WinRT. So WinRT is just another way or an extra way or 
an alternative you can use if one of the other things is not working, stop working because Microsoft made some decisions or whatever. So let's start with the first sample phone numbers. Phone numbers seem easy and they're probably easy if you have an application that is only that only runs on one country. But as soon as your application uses uh, used in more in different countries and more countries or you have to store international numbers, things can become pretty messy very quickly because every country uses a different format for phone numbers. So with that, let's go to the Visual Studio Code. So um, Windows Runtime has a phone number format type that you can instantiate and then format a number that you pass in and it takes any number and returns a phone number according to the current country that you specify in country or region in your time and language, language and region settings. So I'm going to switch this to the United States and these changes are instantly. So I don't have to restart Visual Fox Pro. Um, as a reminder, I put in that I have to be in the United States. So if I put in 480555, because the 555 is what you use in the United States for phone numbers, as we know from every movie, you see that it's formatting things um, like a US number. Area code in parentheses and a hyphen between the first three and the last four digits. We can also decide that we do not want to use the default, whatever the default is, but that we want to pass in this region. So we can say we want to format a number no matter what the, the system is. I'm putting this back to Germany. No matter what the system says, we want to format it as a Canadian number, as a US number or a German number. You pass in the two, digit, um, two letter um, ISO code for the country um, using the try create static method on the phone number formatter. So remember this code is code that you need to write. This is the interface that you can define. You can put any, anything in there and make the interface any way you want. And then your Foxbook program is calling this method. So we call a simple method that's returning a string. We pass uh, in two strings. So that's very easy to handle for Foxbook. And then we have these three lines of code, which you, if you really want it, could reduce to two numbers of uh, two lines of code, but that works too. So what happens if we pass in a Canadian US number and then I'm passing in two numbers, one using an international, using the country code and one that's a domestic way of writing a phone number in Germany. So you can see that one thing, at least if you live in, in Canada, you can see that one thing didn't work as well. Um, Canadian numbers are formatted just like US numbers because Canada is using the same numbering scheme, the North American numbering scheme. But actually, and any Canadian can correct me if I'm wrong, but usually uh, in Canada you use a hyphen. So it's area code hyphen, three digits hyphen, four digits instead of parentheses. So it's not perfect, but what you can see is that in Germany, we have flexible length area codes. So our area codes can be three digits, four digits, five digits, and I think even six digits long. And then the code in Microsoft is detecting that 09181 is actually the area code and anything be behind that, anything, any other character, any other number is the local phone number. And if you need any support on Foxpo, that's the number you call because that's my company phone number. So depend, in, it doesn't matter what country you have, you can now display using the, the phone number formatter, you can display phone numbers that a user entered in the country's original formatting and you can also detect whether it's an area code or not, or even if it's a valid phone number or not. .NET or Windows Runtime also has a feature to predict the number kind. It's not possible to say what kind of number it is because that's uh, for sometimes requires online access. It also, not, not in all countries that information is available, 
but there are some heuristics that it's used out if it's a fixed line, a mobile line, toll-free line, a page or a voicemail, or if it's unknown. So again, we just create an instance of the phone number info and then call the predict number kind, which is giving us an enumeration, the one that we see below here, and which we return it to Foxpo as a string. So I put in a landline, that's my office line, a phone number, a mobile phone number, and Germany mobile phone numbers have a dedicated area code. I also put in an international toll-free number, that's a plus 800 number, country code is 800. And in Canada, they have um, the 600 area code, which is non-geographic services, which can be pagers, cell phones, or any other non-geographic service. If I run this, you see that um, Windows Runtime correctly identified the mobile number as a mobile number and the toll-free number as a toll-free number. Um, for US numbers, it doesn't work as well because for US numbers, you actually have to query information by the provider. It's not, the, the, you cannot tell from just from the number what it is. So, another cool thing I think is matching phone numbers. So co consider you have the case, you have two phone numbers and you want to know if these two phone numbers are identical. Sounds easy, but you can format a phone number in different ways. So see this, I have here my phone number once written as a domestic, uh, as an international one that you can just enter into cell phone internationally. And then the one that has doesn't have the country code, the way that we write them. In this case, I have the same, just different numbers. The, ex, the last digit is different. And in Germany, for instance, we can write numbers in the area code either in parentheses or by uh, slash, separated by slash or by a blank. So if we run this, you can now see that these phone numbers are identical. They refer to the same phone number. These are not identical. And these are identical as well, even though um, you actually have to follow some rules. Like if you see that there's a zero here, because area codes in Germany are start with a zero, but in international format, we drop the zero. So it's not just like that like you can just remove every every non-digit. You you are ha also have to perform some uh, conversions. And if you run this code, uh, the C sharp code. In a Windows console, you actually notice that um, the phone number API is using regular expression and it's using a Google open source library for that. So the Windows runtime is based on Google code. Speech. Um, for speech, I'm doing something that might upset open. Um, remember that I'm talking 20 seconds ahead of you. So whatever you write into the chat, you should have written it 20 seconds ago. Um, I'm going to unplug my headset and turn you on to a speaker so that um, you can hear what my computer is doing. Um, if this doesn't work, uh, please let me know quickly and then we just plug it in and skip the samples because without you hearing the samples, it doesn't make sense uh, to do them.
Christoph, are we supposed to be hearing you talking while you're setting this up? Because no, nobody's hearing you at all. Also nothing coming from your computer speakers. So, do you hear me now? If if it doesn't work, yeah. Now, now we hear you. We were not hearing anything that whole time from when you said you took the headset off that's, until you just put it back on. That's why I gave the ad warning that you're supposed to hear anything, and not me just silently doing anything. Wonderful. So, um, what I said is that Windows has built-in speech synthesizer, which can output text as speech. The languages, it, what languages you have available depends on the language packs you installed in Windows. So you have, in this case, I've installed English in various versions and German, so I can actually um, speak, or the computer can speak in German and, and in English. You um, create the speech synthesizer by initializing the speech synthesizer object, then creating a stream of the text, and then using the media player up here to autoplay, setting the source, and playing the, the text. So if I'm speaking with the default voice, Hello, Virtual Fox Fest. You should hear Hello, Virtual Fox Fest spoken. If not, please let me know because um, I'm going to show you a couple of more samples and it doesn't make sense if you hear, can't hear them. We, we did, or I heard that backstage. Okay. Um, by default, Windows is using the default voice which depends on the regional settings that you've set up here. Uh, it actually depends on the order in which you have the language package sorted. So I have English Germany first, so it's using the first English voice that has text to, text to speech capability, which is English United States and not English Germany. You can see what voice is being used by using this speech default value, um, which is speech synthesizer default voice and then the description. There are other properties available for the voice as well. You can also, list all the voices that are installed. So we have uh, Microsoft David, we have Microsoft George, Stefan, Sean, and a variety of different languages. For every, for every uh, speaker, you can find, figure out what the gender is, what the language is, and what the country for that language is. So we have different English versions that we can use. The order actually depends on the user profile. It's It was a different order for my other account on the same computer. So you cannot hard code those values. You have to dynamically uh, figure out which language or which uh, voice you want to use. So let's do a, a few samples where we, in, in, in addition, pass the number, the index or the voice, and then get the voices and speak the text of that voice. So I'm, I'm, in this case, I'm using Ireland, Sean, um, speaking Irish. This is Ulysses. Would shadows floated silently by through the morning peace from the stairhead seaward where he gazed. Inshore and farther out the mirror of water whitened, spanned by light shot hurrying feet. White breast of the dim sea. The twining stresses, two by two. A hand plucking the heart strings. Merging their twining cords. Wavu height wedded words shimmering on the dim tide. 
as you can see, there are certain limitations of speech synthesis. You, it works for regular text, but any poetry, it doesn't really know how how to how to say them. There are also differences in the uh, speech synthesizers. If we look at same sample, and this time it's be, uh, spoken by David. Which added silently by through the morning piece from the Stariad seaward where he gazed. Inshore and farther out the mirror of water widened, spurned by light shot hurrying feet. White breast of the dim sea. The twining stresses, two by two. A hand plucking the harp strings, merging their twining cords. Wave white wetted words shimmering on the dim tide. You might have noticed that that the word wave white was pronounced differently. So I'm using the three languages. Uh, wave and heart. That's English, United Kingdom. Wave and heart. Irish, English and Ireland, not Irish. Wave white. And that's United States. So actually, the, there's different code being executed depending on the language, not just some rules that have been set up. Um, I'm putting back my headset on, hopefully it works. If you don't hear me, please let me know. So you should hear me now. Yes, we do. Okay. Back to PowerPoint. So what can you use it for? Imagine, because um, Foxpo is running on computers that are even smaller than they used to be, uh, it now makes sense to run really on uh, Foxpo on mobile devices. So you might be in a, in a hand-free situation where you have to have to have a check or have a checklist that you need to follow. Like if you inspect a car in a car repair shop, and it might make sense to actually read the checklist, what you need, what the user is supposed to do. Or if you are a delivery app, it might be a better interface to just talk to the delivery person instead of having them look up things on a tiny display. Or if you are checking inventory, maybe the, your application can tell the user what the next item is. Or if you are in a laboratory app, the sample numbers that you are supposed to handle next could be read. So there's a lot of situations, um, including children's software, where you actually want or might have a better so, uh, solution if you want to, if you speak, or if your application speaks. Any questions? Yes. Um, okay. Maybe I missed that part, but where can we have a list or description of things available in WinRT? Um, there is a... A website, oh, it's... it's on the Microsoft website, the, you get the link. It's on learn.microsoft.com. If you search for Windows Runtime, you will find it. And you also can use that link to get all the available classes. Um, and in the samples down here in the GitHub repository, you just get all the, uh, the, the source code you can use to create your own um, classes in, in, Visual Fox, uh, in Visual Studio to be used in Visual Fox. So this. These samples are available, or similar samples are available on GitHub. And what is the easiest way to find the correct using Windows, that's in quotes, using Windows dot, dot, dot? Um, if you use Visual Studio 2022, it's probably, uh, and have added the, the, um, the uh, contract, it's suggesting those things on, on your own. Otherwise, they are in the documentation. Um, in the, the Microsoft documentation, always starts with the class name and then the namespace. So the usings are in on the website or usually added automatically if you use Visual Studio for your tooling. Okay, that's all we have right now. Okay. Next sample. Geolocation. So basically returning where the computer is. Um, Microsoft Windows is doing this. If you have a GPS on, on your computer, then it's using the GPS device. 
Otherwise, it's actually using a wireless network. It's it has a list of has yeah, has a list of known networks, and if it locate if it locates any of those networks, um, then it matches that to the location. So, for instance, there's one company in Germany that is delivering mobile laboratories, and you want to make sure that you know where the laboratories are positioned because on a construction site they are not necessarily already in Google Maps. So you don't have an address. So you want to know exactly where it is. Or if you imagine having a, um, an app for reading meters where someone is passing by um, uh, houses to, to read, uh, you can use the location to actually assign the, the correct customer to the meter reading. Or if you deal, deal with real estate agents, it might be helpful to actually know where you are. So let's look at the code and .NET. It's actually not that complicated, but we first time we actually have to deal with async. Async um, in Windows runtime is Windows runtime has a definition that everything that takes more than fifty milliseconds seconds has to be async. It cannot be sync synchronous. It has to be asynchronous. Fujifilm Foxport doesn't do very well with asynchronous. Um, doesn't support it at all. So we, you, as a workaround, we call the async function and then get the result, which makes Foxpool wait for the result. The first thing is we need to get access to the geolocator. That can be disabled or um, the, the device might not have a geolocator. So we want to check that we are actually allowed to use the geolocator. Then we create a geolocator object and then get the current position. We get a lot more information than just latitude and longitude if we actually have a GPS device on, like on, on most laptops. You also could get the, the current height, the speed, the direction. Um, in our case, because this is a desktop machine, we only get latitude, longitude, and the accuracy. Let's call this one Foxborough. So I'm integrating in the instance and I'm calling the get location method. And then you see that this is my position, latitude and longitude. To give you an idea what that, where that is or how far actually north we are, what I'm doing is I'm taking the longitude and then I'm subtracting 123.5 degrees from that and then show this in Google Maps. So if I run this, we end up in Canada. So that's my position if I would move to the west right now, the west being behind me. Another feature in Windows Runtime, which is re really useful for, for applications, and it's actually the one that started the session. That's the first sample I had. Um, which triggered the, the research into the Windows one time. And that's OCR, opt optical character recognition. So basically we have an image and we want to have all the text that is on the image as text. So for instance, if you have a document management system, you have scanned images read from a scanner, which you also can do in Foxpool. Um, then you have a page of text, but you don't know anything that's on there. So if you want to support full text search, um, then you run OCR. Um, if you have like a uh, application for, for travel reimbursements, you, you have receipts that you collect. Take Users take a picture, put it into the application, and then you can try to identify things. Actually identifying information on the scanned image like getting the invoice number, getting the amount. That's actually more difficult because um, it only works if you have a fixed format for, for that page. If it's all variant, variable, you, can, you have to use some sort of um, AI in order to, to do this. So let's look at the sample in Foxport for that. Ah, and the one important thing is this OCR function is not relying on Microsoft Azure or any of the cloud services. It's working on the device. It's not transferring the image somewhere else. 
So um, in countries like in Germany, uh, where we, data protection is relevant, and in, in areas, even in, in the States and Canada, like healthcare, where you, you cannot just put something into the cloud. Um, these these options or these are options that you still can use, and you also don't have to pay per OCR. It's just your computer time. So, so I'm showing you first what it looks like when we run the control form. So, yeah. turn off. So I open a picture. I'm using two of them. That's an XKCD um, text that is easy to read, but it's surprisingly hard for Windows to recognize the text. So I'm running the OCR function. And what this code is doing, it's putting a label on top of that word that has been discovered. So if I turn off the image, you can see that the text has been recognized, sort of. We can also specify the language. If we use a different language and recognize the text, some of things change, some of things remain, remain identical. It's, it's working better on, better on text that is actually text, like this picture of an escape route. And that's German text. And it's actually recognizing this as German because there are German characters in, in the text. So even if I leave it on English United States, you see that um, I have the, the text, like above here, Flucht you see that it has recognized this. So what you get back is a cursor. What, what, we, what I wrote it, it, to get back is a cursor. First of all, the OCR engine is giving you a line number. So every, every line of text like this one here, telephone number 112, anrufen call, telephone number 112, you see that's all in line number, line number five. You get the, the left and the top position where the text was found, and you also get the width and the height. Um, in my case, I just let the labels all be the same dimension, but if you want to, you could actually make the text larger or smaller. And of course, you can read this text then using the speech API. So how this works in, in code is we have for one thing, we have the um, Windows Runtime API call, call, code that we need to call from C Sharp. So again, because this takes more than 50 milliseconds usually, we have an async method that we make synchronous by using the result property. We need two things. We need an image that is stored in a file, and we need the language that we want to recognize. We use the file object to read the image, then use a bitmap decoder to create a um, bitmap image of the content of the file, which is again taking over 50 milliseconds. So it, uh, it's another asynchronous operation. And then we get a software bitmap async. This is actually from the sample. So this code, I just used what Microsoft was su suggesting to use. Then we try to create the language, um, the OCR engine from the language. And again, this depends on what you have installed in the language and region settings. So I have language uh, packs for English and for German. Um, actually, I have German, it's, it's installed. And you can add any of those that you want. And when it supports, um, uh, it's, it's not giving those here, uh, but some of the languages are supported for OCR and some are not. When we do have support for the language that we passed in, we get an OCR engine back. Well, the only thing we do is we say recognize async, another operation taking more than 50 milliseconds, passing in the image and getting a rather complex result, an OCR result that has all kinds of information. Among them, it's a collection of lines. We go through the lines. Each line 
keeping track of the line number. And in each line, we have a collection of words. So we get the words and we replace any um, quotation mark with CHR34, the Foxport code. So um, what we actually get is here building, building up is Foxport code. So we have a number for the line number, then the bounding rack left, top, width, and height, and the text. This is basically an array of parts of um, the insert command. So if I open the form, what we do is um, we create a cursor. That's the one that you saw in the browser window, line number, left top with height and text. And then we create an instance of the OCR engine, passing in the image that we that's, that we selected. It's just a regular image control and the select button does nothing but a get picture and assigning the picture property of the image control. And then we get from the combo box, we get the language value, which we the user selected. After that, all we do is we pass it into A lines, get every single line, and then use micro substitution to insert into the cursor and the values being a comma separated list of the values with the um, quotes being correct as um, code. Next, we create a transparent container that we put on top of the image. And then for every word that we have, we create a label, add it at the label, and move it to the position that has that the, uh, the OCR engine indicated. So very simple, actually. So that's OCR. Any questions for these two samples, geolocation and OCR? Or just just one on OCR. Does the OCR work with cursive handwriting? Um, I don't think so. Um, but because it's a Windows feature, as soon as Windows supports it, your app automatically gets the the feature. It's it's with this engine, you don't have to buy anything, you don't have to ship anything. It's built into Windows. And Microsoft keeps improving, and whatever improvement Microsoft is doing, your app will have them automatically. So I guess at some point it will have handwriting, cursive handwriting. But it, it struggled on the cursive or uh, the comic font. So I guess that handwriting isn't an option. No other questions. Correct. Okay. So another sample. Then you can you have, will have all these samples available. I'm submitting them to Tamar after the the session. So even then we don't get to all the samples. You can look at the samples and run them yourself. So next sample is text query. Text query is basically over there. No. The engine that you know in Explorer, if you search um, search indexer, if you search for any, any file that is available on the system. So it's a way that you, you create a semantic text query, you have a search string, you have text that you want to search, and then uh, you can use Um, you can search, for instance, this text that we've seen in the, previously. So we search for off two. These are two words separated by this by a space, and there's no quote quote in there. So it's searching for off or for two, and it's returning the two offs on the right side here and the two by two, um, giving the position and the length of the word that it matched matched. You can use the syntax uh, using quotes. So I'm searching for of two and of the, and of two isn't in the code uh, in this in this text, just two by two. Of the is at uh, position 204, at the, that's the end here. So um, you can give your users the ability to either search single words or search for phrases without you having to do anything special. You just pass in the search string, which is the same they use in Explorer to search for files. Um, 
and let the, the code or let Windows handle this. Um, you can also combine those. So if I search for off the and gazed, I get um, gazed once and off the um, also. Not all of these features that are working in Explorer are working here. So we, we can search for the title and content. So we don't, do not get any result for the title because we didn't specify any. We get a result for the content. But if we say we want to have the and only hits that where the title and the content have a match, it's still returning the, the match that has only the content. So it's ignoring any operators. Basically, it's just searching for the words and for phrases. This is not suitable for indexing. It's just really a search. It's, it's not, you cannot use it to seek. You can, if you have a memo field, you can search for one memo field, or you can scan through the table and perform the search individually on every single memo field. Um, another control is the segmenter. The segmenter, over here, um, breaks text into individual segments, usually words. For English, this doesn't sound really that useful because if we look at a typical English text like, again, this one, and we segment this, all you get is the individual words. It's just words. It might be helpful because you don't get anything that's not a, not a word, but uh, not every language is as easy. If we do the same thing for German, for instance, we have words um, that's one piece in German. We have words that are combined, like Glückseligkeit, which has the word Glück and Seligkeit, so in this case, you get the word, the, the word Glück. And as an alternative, you also get the full word, but also the, the second part of that word. Other languages do not use any spaces at all. So there's no necessarily no word separation in the text. It's all based on context. And this API will also do this, which is more common in Asian languages than in European languages. Um, German is actually a good sample because we have something um, like this word in German, Donau Dampfschiffahrts Kapitäns Patentanwärter. We can just combine things. So it means candidate for the captain's license to operate a steamboat on the Danube River. Um, if, if you try to read this as a non German speaker, it's pretty hard. But if you run this, and Windows actually knows that this is made out of six different words. And it tells you what the individual parts are. And it says that this is also a word that you can use. Unfortunately, again, it's not perfect. There's another tongue twister in Germany. The YouTube video is um, in the link here, which basically says that it's another combination of where we just chain words. Uh, that's And if you run this and try to segment this, expected would be that separation, you see that Windows doesn't know anything about that. So it's not working for all the words, but it's at least it's it's a helpful start. And it does or can help you if you want to create your own full text indexing or search to get um, individual words out of different languages, especially if your application has to support different languages. One more sample that I want to cover is cryptography. Um, I have not found information about what API, um, Windows Runtime API is using behind the scenes because it's not all written, newly written. A lot of the features in, um, in the Windows Runtime are actually Windows APIs that are, and are just wrappers around Windows APIs. But it appears to be using the Crypto Next Generation API, the current uh, crypto API, and provides another way of accessing the functionality. For some of the features, it's actually easier to use program that is just plain Foxport code. But since cryptography is really important, I thought a refresher would be a good thing. So first thing is we look at hashes. Hashing is a one-way function. You put some in, something in, and you get a fixed value, a fixed length value back. 
uh, you can use that instead of passwords um, to quickly identify identical data. Two documents that have the same content also have the same hash. Or you can use it to sign, kind of sign your data, not for hackers, but for the user that is occasionally opening a DBF file in Excel. Or if you do something like um, a sequential, sequential ledger where you have to make sure that nobody deletes any records in between, what you can do is you can add a hash field to your table and then hash to create the, the hash value for the current, for a newly created record, you hash the current record and the, the hash value of the previous record, combine those to create a new hash value. So every time someone is deleting a record or modifying a record um, after the fact, then the hash value will not uh, match. So, and I'm just showing you, I'll show you the, the code for that. It's actually a little bit more complicated and and when it's one-time API, you have to open the algorithm and then you have to use the provider to create a hash specifying the hash algorithm. Um, hashing always operates on bytes, not on strings, not on words. So you have to convert it to binary text in some way. I'm using UTF-16, big endian encoding. Um, you append this to a message, message buffer, and then you get the hash value, which is, which, um, which is a fixed length value that we encode to hex string and return it to Foxpo. So, let's look at what this looks like. So, I'm hashing fixed value. I get back the hex value for the hash. You don't have to use a hex value. Um, you can also return a base 64 string if you want. The rest of the code is the same. So, so maybe that's more usable for you in, in this case. And we can also use it to pass um, binary data. So we, we pass a binary hex 64 value in this case. So, um, we actually we hex hex value. We encode the value into hex, so it's not using um, UTF-16 big and endian. It's but it's using whatever code page you are running on, and then hashing the value. It should be three a zero zero and yada yada yada. If you want to pass binary data directly, what you have to use is you have to use a byte array in .NET. On the Foxbo side, you have to do a little bit, little bit more work. Most of the work is done by .NET Bridge, but instead of calling the, the method directly, so first of all, you have to um, cast it into a binary using the cast function, and then you have to use the invoke method on the bridge object. You cannot, because it's not any longer COM compatible, you have to pass it as uh, use it doing the workaround that's in .NET Bridge. Uh, Rick talked about this in his session last day. So the result is the same because it's the same hash value. So the other thing we can do is we can create random data. Random data in cryptography random data is actually real random order, or as, as, as random as possible data. It's not like the RAND function in FOSPO, which is returning the same values for the same input. You would use random data for sorting passwords, uh, for generating application passwords that users don't have to type in. Um, we had all of this in the security session. So let's look at what this looks like. So in this case, I'm calling a .NET code random binary, generate random, and we just specify a length, and then I'm encoding this to a hex string. I could have returned it as a byte array, and then got a binary in, in Foxpo when I call it using .NET, .NET bridge. So you can generate any length of binary data, and it's totally random data. So good for sort, good for passwords, good for the initialization vector, any any of that. 
In addition, you can generate random numbers. Those are unsigned integers. In Foxbo, we turn them into signed integers. So every time we get a 32-bit value that is minus two gig, uh, between minus two gig and plus two gig. And these are true random numbers. So if you need have a need for a real random value, you can use those. Any question about this part? Nope. Okay. There are a couple of other samples that you find, like using security as secure encryption. Um, you remember from, from um, past session that um, instead of ECB, electronic code book, you should use cipher block chaining, CBC. And if possible, you should also use a random initialization vector to make sure that um, the data is um, en encrypted correctly. The other thing we can get is information about the current time zone. So um, you can find out what time zone the user has um, set in in his regular settings. Um, there's a feature for timers. So if VFP timers are not working for you for some reason, you can use a timer that calls back when the elapsed um, or the period has elapsed, which is not depending on a Foxbo timer. And we also have information about the user. So those are the samples that are available to you in, uh, in the session material after I sent them to Tamar and Tamar uploaded them to the server. So not right now, but they will be available very soon. There are lots of, of functionality that's in Windows Runtime where I do not have included or not created any samples. For instance, there's a whole bunch of pause functionality. So you can um, uh, control the display, you can control, print receipts, like in a shop environment, you have payment terminal support to some degree, that's all available within um, Windows Runtime. There's also a PDF API that doesn't have a lot of features. Um, it actually has only one feature or two features. It takes a PDF file and it returns a collection of pages in that PDF file. And it lets you render every page into an image. So you can use that to display PDF files um, as a native image or print PDF files on a Foxbo report if you want. There's compression. I tried to work on that sample. It didn't work. It, compressing would work fine. Decompressing would not. And it's not um, doesn't make a lot of sense if you compress something that you cannot read, cannot read afterward. I really wanted to do the AI sample, but it turned out that this is really complex. And also speech recognition, which would be a good partnering offer for speech output. Um, imagine having someone checking the list and then just say OK or failed. And your application can then use this information. It's available, but it's really complex too. So in summary, the Windows Sometimes offers some interesting features, some not so interesting features. Some of the features are available by other means like cryptography. Some are only available through the Windows Runtime. Um, so it's another option you have. It's not necessarily something you might need to use or might ha have a need for, but it's at least another option that's available. You unfortunately cannot avoid using an, any other language at all like C Sharp or C++. Any questions? There don't seem to be any, but probably okay. some folks will come to your Q&A with some more. Oh, time. yeah. So thank you very much. Do not forget to give me your username and password so that I can fill out the evaluation for you. Thank you.